I've been studying the sanctuary. And uh, there's so much to learn in the sanctuary. If you've never studied it before, I'll do a, a brief review as we get started this morning. But our challenge as we've studied together is to find Jesus in every part of that sanctuary. And so I hate titles. I usually don't use titles for sermons because what happens when you put a title down is people try to figure out the sermon before they hear it. Is anybody guilty of that? Am I the only one? Right? You see a title and all of a sudden you're like, I know exactly what that's going to be about. I can assure you this morning that, that by the time I'm done this morning, by God's grace, you'll never see the Ark of the Covenant the same. And I mean that in a good way. Amen? All right. Well, the series I've been doing is called Follow Me. And we're looking at the ministry of Jesus through the sanctuary. Now, our key text, as we've studied together over at Maranatha, has been Revelation 14 and verse 4 which says, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now in context, this is the 144,000, a very special group of people. One of their characteristics is that they follow the Lamb where? Wherever He goes. Who here wants to follow the Lamb wherever He goes? Amen. I know I do. By His grace, every day I ask Him to teach me to follow Him, to learn from Him the ways that He walked. Now, the way that he walked, as we're studying in the context of the sanctuary, Psalm 77, verse 13, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? The way of salvation is found in that sanctuary. And of course, that model that was built by Moses there in the desert, the purpose that God gave was that he might dwell with them. And of course, he was given in vision that model that he should build of that earthly sanctuary. That sanctuary was broken down into three sets of three. You've got three areas. You've got the outer courtyard, you've got the holy place, and then the most holy place. In each area, there are three items. In the outer courtyard, you have the altar of burnt offerings, you have the, the altar of sacrifice, and you have the laver. As you move into the holy place, you've got that table of showbread, you've got the altar of incense, and the seven-branch candlestick. And as you move behind the veil into the most holy, you have the box, the ark, you have the lid, the mercy seat, and the angels on top. Three sets of three, obviously pointing us to the Godhead, the triune God that we serve. Now when we look at an overview of the sanctuary, we're taught the way of salvation, aren't we? We come first to the Lamb in that outer por portion of the sanctuary where we find justification. The idea that we come to Jesus just as we are. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm so glad we don't have to clean ourselves up, right? We would all be in a hopeless condition. But we come to Him just as we are, and there we meet Jesus right there in the courtyard. We experience that justification. He immediately moves us into the process of sanctification. And there you learn about the bread, the daily partaking of the Word, the altar of incense, the prayer life that floats over the veil into the very presence of God, and of course the candlestick as He works out His good works through you, giving glory to the Father. And then that final stage, glorification, where we learn to perfectly reflect the Lamb. Who here wants to perfectly reflect Him? I know I do. It seems like an impossible work, doesn't it? But guess what? We serve a God of impossibilities. Amen? And He can do all things. Now, I have looked many different flavors of this three-stage process. I find it interesting as I'm reading through Scripture, many times Scriptures will open up to me in ways they never have before. Have you ever had that happen? You're studying something over here, and then a text on the other side opens up for you in ways that you've never seen before. So you've got three distinct functions of Jesus in the sanctuary. In the courtyard, He's the Lamb. In the holy place, he's the priest. In the most holy place, he becomes the judge. The beautiful part of this is that it's in perfect order. Those three distinct functions, lamb, priest, and judge. And when we move into the holy place with him, he doesn't stop being the lamb. The blood of the lamb is still available for you and I as he intercedes. Amen? Amen. As he moves into the most holy place, he does not stop being the priest. Thank the Lord. Amen? He's still there interceding for us. And so three distinct functions, almost like the three gifts given to Jesus at his birth. The myrrh, a gift you would give uh, to, to someone in burial. Frankincense, a gift you would give to a priest. And of course, gold, a gift you would give to a judge or a king. Even the Bible, the New Testament, is, is ultimately laid out in sanctuary order. The Gospels are where we meet Jesus, right? 
The epistles then are where we learn to walk with Jesus and the book of Revelation wraps up the idea that we will someday, by God's grace, perfectly reflect Him. Perfect order. What I like about the sanctuary is when you're looking at the holy place, the work of sanctification, you, you must have had first to go through that first door. There's three doors as well. That outer door, then the door into the holy, then the door into the most holy, but you can't go out of order, can you? You can't be in the work of sanctification if you haven't first experienced what? Justification. You must meet the Lamb before He can work in you. Amen? So I love the fact that perfect order is there. Now I could talk all morning on the sanctuary. We've spent weeks and weeks and weeks at Maranatha studying the sanctuary. But this morning, for the sake of time, I want to move into the most holy. I want to peek behind the veil. Something that we couldn't have done in Old Testament times, could have we? Only the high priest could go behind that, that veil into the most holy. But by God's grace and praise the Lord for His Word, we have the ability this morning to peek together behind the veil and see the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark is more mentioned in Scripture than is any other piece of the sanctuary furniture. It's mentioned 185 times under 10 different designations in Scripture. Here they are, here are the 10, and there are slight variations there. But 185 times the ark is mentioned throughout the scripture. In Exodus 25, verses 10 through 12, we read as Moses is instructed how to make this ark. They shall make the ark of what kind of wood? Acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. So the ark in our language would be about three feet in length and about two feet in breadth and width. And again, it was made out of what kind of wood? Acacia wood. It says, you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. What was the testimony, by the way? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Yeah, ten commandments in the ark. Now, oftentimes, when I used to envision the ark or I've seen pictures of the ark, the poles went this way. In other words, here's the curtain, and the poles would go this way. Isn't the way that they usually see it? But the Bible actually tells us in 1 Kings that the poles went the other way. And this picture doesn't even really fully demonstrate it, because I believe those poles would have been at ground level. Notice here in 1 Kings 8 and verse 8, the poles of the ark extended that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place. In other words, they poked out underneath the veil, almost hugging the altar of incense. Uh, could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. Now again, the ark made of acacia wood. Now acacia wood is a very interesting wood. It's beautiful. It has a very tight grain, and the Septuagint actually designates the acacia wood as an incorruptible wood. Now the reason it says that is because the grain is so tight that insects have trouble bearing into it and corrupting that wood. And so as you can see in the pictures, it's a beautiful wood. Um, I've never actually owned acacia wood, but looking at those pictures, I'd like to have some furniture made of that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Psalm 1 and verse 3 is one of many texts that tell us that often God, God likens His people to trees or to wood. Psalm 1 and verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in, se in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall what? Shall prosper. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 through 8, same concept. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a what? Like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Jesus even likened himself to a tree in Luke chapter 23 and verse 31. He says, For if they do these things in the green wood, referring to himself, what will be done in the dry? 
Now, I'd like to submit to you this morning that that box made of acacia wood, inlaid with gold and overlaid with gold, represents Jesus himself. Now, the reason I say that is because what we have here is essentially three boxes. The box in the middle is the acacia wood box, inlaid with gold, filled with the Holy Spirit, overlaid with gold, covered in his Father's righteousness. What you have in the box is a representation of Jesus himself. In other words, the frailty of humanity inlaid, filled with the Holy Spirit, overlaid with his Father's righteousness. Leslie Harding, in his book, With Jesus in His Sanctuary, says it very eloquently. He says, Enclosed between its two golden wrappers, the acacia box was kept from contact with the corrupting earth. Was this to picture the incarnate one embraced by the gold of the faith and love of the two other personages of the heavenly trio? The everlasting Father and the eternal Spirit did not suffer their Holy One to see corruption. The gold of heaven's encompassing love buttressed the wood of the fragile humanity of the man of Nazareth and preserved him from every corrupting danger. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4. The ark containing his law was to be a symbol of who? Of himself. Interesting. You know, acacia wood doesn't come only in tree form. Acacia wood also can be found in bushes in that area. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting, the bush that was on fire that Moses discovered, acacia wood, and the angel appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush, so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. In other words, there was something frail, there was something in the middle of this fire that should have burned up, but it did not. The golden glow from that bush, the fire that was within, the fire that was without, but yet the acacia wood was not consumed. Very similar to the ark, isn't it? Exodus 3, verses 5 and 6, as Moses is conversing, then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to do what? To look upon God. Our God, the Bible says, is a consuming fire, yet in its frailty this wood was not consumed. Have you ever read in Isaiah 33 the question, Who shall dwell with the everlasting fire? Who shall dwell with his, his everlasting burnings? And then the question is answered, he who walks righteously, who speaks up rightly. And there's a long list of righteousness. In other words, the only one that can dwell with the everlasting fire is he who walks with God completely. Would Jesus be a perfect symbol of that? You better believe it. Now, if the ark is a symbol of Christ himself, what would you, what would you expect to find in the ark? Psalm 40 and verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is where? Within my heart. We know that the law is another way of saying God's what? His character. Everything the Bible says about the law, it says about God himself. And so if the ark is this symbol of Christ himself, then we would only expect for the character of God to be in the very heart of it. Amen? Now what was on the top of that ark? It was known as the mercy seat, Exodus 25, 17 through 19. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, one piece with the mercy seat. The mercy seat is a symbol of the grace of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may, what? Obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the day of atonement, this is where the blood, by the way, would be sprinkled seven times on the mercy seat. It's where the law of God and the grace of God meet. Sons and daughters of God, page 66, the cover of this ark was called the mercy seat to signify that although death was the penalty for transgressing the law, mercy came through Jesus Christ 
to pardon the repentant, believing sinner. Can you say amen to that? You know, as you study the sanctuary, it's like Jesus is everything in there. You start in the outer court, he's the lamb, right? You start moving through the sanctuary, well, he's the door. He's even the door that enters in. He said in the New Testament, I am the door, right? As you're moving through the sanctuary, he's the bread. I'm the bread that came from heaven. It's by his merits that our prayers float to the Father. I'm in the holy place now. It's the candlestick. He said, I am the light of the world. And so every piece of the sanctuary as you're moving through, if you study and see the symbolism played out, it's Christ. And he's drawing you and he's drawing me through this process of sanctification. Romans chapter 3, 24 through 26, contains that dreadful word every pastor, every preacher hates, propitiation. You know why? Because we can never say it right. Right? It's a tough word. You get your P's tangled up. You get, you know, the whole word just kind of gets your tongue tangled. Romans 3, 24 through 26, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood, through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How is it that God could have this law of perfect righteousness and yet justify a sinner who is perfectly guilty? How does God take the two? How does he be just and yet the justifier of the one who doesn't deserve it? The answer is the mercy seat. And the word propitiation is actually the word mercy seat. It's the Greek word hilasterion. It occurs only here and in Hebrews 9.5 where it clearly refers to that part of the Ark of the Covenant usually known as the mercy seat. You could fill in those words, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as His mercy seat. If the box is Christ, then the head of the box, the crown of the box, is the fact that He's merciful, that He can be just, and the justifier at the same time. Psalm 85 and verse 10, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have what? Have kissed. It is the mercy seat that teaches us that. Patriarchs and Prophets 348, one wing of each angel was stretched forth on, the, on high while the other was folded over the body. In token of reverence and humility, the position of the cherubim with their faces turned toward each other and looking reverently downward toward the ark represents the reverence with which the heavenly host regard the law of God and their interest in the plan of salvation. Why are they looking down? Because Christ came down. Where did the plan of salvation begin to be played out? Here. In the frailty and the humanity coming in the likeness, Romans 8 says, of sinful flesh. 1 Peter Chapter 1 and verse 12, For those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. You see, they too, they want to know how will God be just and the justifier of the guilty. The mercy seat answers that question. Now there was something that was added later to the ark. Actually, there were several things. I've been teasing Maranatha for several weeks as we've been reading in Hebrews that there were three items in the ark. Right? Not only the Ten Commandments, but then you had Aaron's rod that budded, and you had the pot of the manna. Well, you read in 1 Kings that there's nothing in the ark except for the tablets of the covenant, except for the Ten Commandments. And I've been teasing them, what happened to those other two items? That's another story. But there was something else that was placed in the side of the ark later. It came later, right? It was called the Book of the Law. We know what the Book of the Law was, right? It was the ceremonies, it was the feasts, it was the things that Moses wrote with his own handwriting. And we read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, Moses is told to take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness, what? Against you. It wasn't there from the beginning. It was added later and it was a witness against the people. Three sets of three. Courtyard holy place, most holy place. Three items in each place. Now within the Ark of the Covenant, we have three sets of three within the Ark itself. We have the angels, the mercy seat, and the box. 
we have these three concentric boxes that make up the box itself. The wood in the center, inlaid with gold, overlaid with gold. And we have the Ten Commandments inside, the manna and Aaron's rod, three sets of three within the most holy place itself. Now so holy was this ark, as we mentioned earlier, no one could look upon the ark and live. There must be some kind of covering, there must be some kind of veil. Even when the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, so much incense was put out that it was as if there was a cloud in there and they couldn't perfectly see the ark in all its glory. When they would tear down the sanctuary by God's direction and move it, the priest would actually go into the holy place backwards and they would take down that veil that separated the holy from the most holy and, the, and backwards they would go and they would cover the ark with that veil. We read about that in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 5. When the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his son shall come and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Now what was that veil like? What did it look like? Exodus 26 and verse 31. You shall make a veil woven of blue purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen it shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim you know how you get the color purple by the way you combine blue and red blue and red make purple now blue in god's word represents his law numbers chapter 15 37 through 39 they were instructed to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the what? Commandments of the Lord and do them. So blue represented the law. Now red throughout scripture can represent death or blood. And purple, as you search it out through scripture, represents royalty. You have the combination within the veil of the law, of death, and of royalty. Now the ark as they moved it, was always covered. Again, I had to rethink through some of these things as I studied for these messages because oftentimes you see an artist's rendition of something and it and sticks in your mind. And so I've seen, you know, the, the marching against Jericho and they're carrying the ark and it's not covered. And that just kind of always stuck in my mind. But no, the ark as it was moved was always covered. Think about the ark in the crossing of the Jordan. The ark represented power, didn't it? It always went before the people, and when they marched, that ark was set before them as a symbol of the power of God. Joshua chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove. What, what grove? Hmm. And came to the Jordan, and he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after how many days? Three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Is the ark leading them somewhere they haven't gone before? Yeah. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. And you know, the Bible says they crossed on dry ground. The water separated. The Ark paved the way. The Ark went first as a symbol of Christ. He is our forerunner. Amen? He is power. When they marched with that ark, oftentimes, if they were in right relationship with God, it was the ark that brought that overcoming power. The walls of Jericho fell at that ark. Let's bring it all together. The ark, as I'm submitting to you this morning, is actually a symbol of Christ himself. First of all, it's his humanity, that acacia wood, filled with divinity, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then overlaid or covered in his Father's righteousness and protection. Three concentric boxes representing the triune God. Second point is that in the heart of that ark are his commandments, his, his law, his character. Psalm 40, verses 7 through 8, a messianic psalm, by the way. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of who? Of me. 
I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. There were four holes in that ark in order that it would be lifted up. Those poles that went through the ark were never to be removed. All this imagery, by the way, culminates at the cross. Every bit of it has its pinnacle moment at the cross. The ark, the imagery of the ark, and the reality of Christ meet together at the cross. Did Jesus have four holes placed in his body? Yes, he did. Was he lifted up? Yes, he was. Psalm 22 and verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Great Controversy, page 674. Remember, those poles were to be removed when? Never. Never. What does that mean? Great Controversy, 674. Every trace of the curse. She's talking about the end of sin now. End of the millennium. It's forever gone. Every trace of the curse is swept away. One reminder alone remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of His crucifixion. Upon His wounded head, upon His side, His hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. Wow. We who deserve the marks have them erased. They're, they're forever gone. New bodies. No imperfections. What an irony. But the one who doesn't deserve them will forever bear the scars. One, one reminder remains. The ark had a crown of mercy where law and grace met. I call it a crown. It was at the head of the ark. On the cross, do we see that same crown of mercy as they were spitting upon him, as they were mocking him and whipping him and beating him? How is it that Jesus responded? Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Is that the mercy seat, friends? It is to me. The law demanded punishment, but Jesus instead pled for the mercy of the Father. And where did that plead come from? From his mouth, from the head of the ark. Covered in a veil, that veil was his humanity. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His what? His flesh. Do we have that symbol of His flesh brought into the crucifixion experience? Yes. When He died, we're told that the veil in the temple was, tor was torn in two from top to bottom, supernatural. Very thick veil just ripped, representing the fact that His body was, was broken was ripped for you and I. The law, that veil being of three colors, blue, red, and purple. On the cross, the law demanded death. The law being blue demanded death, which was red. And the outcome of that is purple. The combination of the two, royalty. Why does it equal purple or royalty? Because Jesus, because He paid the price, now has a name above every name above all names. And even the wicked someday will bow before Him and say, you are righteous and just and worthy. Amen? John chapter 19, 1 through 3, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged Him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, there must have been blood, and put it on His head, and they put on Him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck Him with their hands. The three elements are there. You've got the blood, you've got the demands of the law, and you've got a purple robe which represents royalty, and they even called him a king. They even called him a king. Philippians 2, verses 8, 8 through 11, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because he was willing to do that for you and I, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Deserving of the highest royalty. Amen?
You remember what I said earlier about there being something added later? The book of the law was not the law, right? The law was in the ark, but later there came this testimony against us. It wasn't the, the spear that pierced his side that killed Jesus, was it? He was already what? He was already dead. There's something that came later. And where was the book of the law placed? In the side of the ark. John chapter 19, verse 34, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. That book of the law was full of blood. It was full of cleansing and washings and ceremonies and feasts. It wasn't the law. It came later, and it was placed in the side. It wasn't the spear that killed Jesus. It came later. But nevertheless, it was there as a testimony that he had died. He was already dead. The price was paid. The last point is just as that ark was marched before the people, it went before them. He was their forerunner. He was their overcomer in the same way we should have Jesus before us. Amen? He is our forerunner. He is our example. He is our overcomer. And he says to each and every one of us, follow me. Come, I've shown you the way. Follow in my footsteps. John chapter 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I like what he says in John chapter 12 and verse 32. And if, I, if I'm lifted from the earth, I will draw how many peoples? All peoples to myself. You see, every image of that ark finds its pinnacle moment on the cross. And every time Israel marched with the ark, it's as if they were saying, look to the cross. Look to Christ. He is the true overcomer. He is the one that will pay the price that will be both just and the justifier of everyone present. I know today when you read the sermon title, you were expecting a dry sermon on the law and the ark. Come on, be honest. I hope, brothers and sisters, that we will never look at the ark the same way. Amen?